Hi, good afternoon, everyone. If you all can just give us two minutes, we're just having a bit of technical difficulty. Thank you. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. And I would like to welcome each and every one of you to our Love Your Eyes webinar, where we'll be learning from two well-known professionals how we can love our eyes and preserve our sight. This is being done to commemorate the month of October, which brings awareness towards blindness and visual impairment, both as Blindness Awareness Month and World Sight Day, which was held on the 14th of October. To begin, I would just like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Niall Farnon. Dr. Farnon is an Irish trained optometrist. Currently, he is the head of optometry unit in the Faculty of the Medical Sciences at the University of the West Indies and has his doctorate in optometry from Ashton University in the United Kingdom. His areas of interest are contact lens, practical lenses, low vision, and also patient management. He has held several positions within the Trinidad and Tobago Optometrist Association, the professional body for optometry in the Trinidad and Tobago. He is also the secretary of the Trinidad and Tobago Opticians Registration Council, which is the licensing body of Trinidad and Tobago. He has lectured at conferences locally, regionally, regionally and internationally. So I would just like to welcome Dr. Niall Farnon. Thank you, Kiyomi, and thank you everybody for being here. So I would like to thank Kiyomi and the TTOSA for organizing this wonderful event. It's not very easy to organize an event, so well done Kiyomi and your colleagues. And this is a, a beautiful topic that we're gonna talk about for this afternoon. And I'm going to mention some of the topics, and then Ms. Marchak is going to mention some of the other topics. And of course, if anybody has any questions, any comments along the way, we do have a nice audience here so we can be friendly and ask the questions as we go along. And then Kiyomi or one of the other members of the TTOSA can stop me and we'll go ahead. Now, I know Ms. Marchak is going to tell you some fun facts about the eyes, but I just wanted to give you a fun fact about today. So the Celts, which were quite a long time ago, were one of the first people to celebrate Halloween, and it is actually a very Irish event, because the majority of Irish people have Celtic origins. And so it really is the day of All Hallows Eve, because again, tomorrow obviously is November the 1st. So I'd like to say to you in my national language, Eta Hana Hona Dweeb, which means happy Halloween night. And I hope you all stay safe tonight. So one of the things that we wanted to talk about was how to maintain proper eye health. Now, if you're not familiar, this is what the back of the eye should look like. So when I look into the back of the eye and the optometry students look into the back of the eye, that's what we hope to see. And that's what we want to see. Now, I know some of you may have just had your lunch. So again, you may be a bit squeamish. But this is what it could look like. And this is a diabetic patient who's having significant problems with their eyes. And you should be able to see there's no comparison between the one on the left and the one on the right. 
And this is the difficulty that things can happen very, very easily. And then we've lost our vision, which would be the case in this patient. So the first thing we would all recommend, and I know Ms. Marchark is gonna talk about this later, is regular eye exams. And just to kick it off, these are some of the suggested eye exam intervals. So anybody under the 18, age of 18, ideally every year. If you're between 18 and 40, every two years, unless you advise otherwise. And if you're 40 and over and have no family history of glaucoma, then again, continue on two years, unless otherwise told. And if you're 40 and over and you have a family history of glaucoma, then you really should be getting your eyes tested every year. And then when you reach over 70, it goes back to every year. Now, a lot of people may ask, well, what's the point? And I know Ms. Marchark's gonna go through that. So when we get to that stage, we will be hearing the benefits of it. But when you think about it, there's never a bad reason to go ahead and get your eyes examined. If you have any doubts, get your eyes examined. So one of the points there is about glaucoma. Oh, sorry, if you have diabetes, then it should be every year. And if you have glaucoma, again, it should be every year. So a lot of these things also have connection with family history. So if anybody in your family, particularly your parents or your brothers and sisters, have glaucoma, then you are at risk of getting glaucoma. Things like diabetes, keratoconus, retinitis pigmentosa, and other genetic diseases can be very easily affected by other family members. Now again, sometimes people panic that someone has back home and in the family, but that means I'm going to get it, not necessarily. It means you're more at risk of getting it. And so we have to pay more attention if I am one of those individuals. It doesn't guarantee that it is gonna to happen to you. So we've had a great question there, what is glaucoma? So glaucoma is a group of diseases where eventually your side vision becomes affected. So when we're driving, watching television, we're looking down the road, we're using our central vision. But the side vision is what we use to navigate, to make sure no one's bumping into us, to make sure that we're taking a left or a right, even on the corners that we don't bump into people. That we're aware of what's happening around us, that we're going down steps or the steps above us. And that's our side vision. And for some reason, glaucoma affects that. Now, one of the challenges is most of our daily tasks you see far away. And the issue is bit by bit, our side vision will be getting worse and it can be anything five years, listeners, five years before you will notice that it's changed. Because it happens very, 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 very gradually. And it's only when you start bumping into things or you start having car accidents or you start falling down steps and you begin to realize, well, there's something wrong with my side vision. So even though you can see down the road, even though you can watch television perfect, people get confused. Well, how can it happen? Then one day you wake up, and as I said, you start bumping into things. And nobody knows why it happens, and there is no cure. But it can be delayed when it's picked up as soon as possible by the use of eye drops. And so you put drops in at night, and then it prevents the progression of the loss of side vision. But unfortunately, any side vision that has been lost cannot be regained. Does that answer the person's question? Please let me know. But it is devastating and one of the biggest loss of vision in sweet tea and tea. Now it's quite easily picked up if you go for regular eye exams. Right, you're welcome. Thank you for the question. So that's why if you have someone in your family who has glaucoma, and you're over the age of 40, then regular eye exams every year 
should be something on your calendar, just like going to the dentist and other medical people that way. Again, there's no guarantee it will affect you, but you're more at risk of it affecting you than someone who doesn't have a family history of it. And you know, maybe it's culturally, but sometimes I see a lot of patients and when they have diabetes, when they have glaucoma, keratoconus, retinitis pigmentosa, another one, sometimes they're a little bit embarrassed or a little bit afraid to tell their family. But we need to, listeners, show these people the need to have regular eye exams. Because as I said, it's a devastating loss of vision. And as we all know, we're only given one pair of eyes by the Lord. And a lot of these things are not at this moment stopped by just waiting to see what happens. It needs some intervention, whether it's surgery or eye drops, just sitting there waiting, hoping it would get better. It doesn't work like that. It's not like indigestion when we hope it goes away. In fact, it's just going to get worse. So again, if you have glaucoma, then tell everybody in your family, particularly your brothers and sisters, and even your children. And if you know somebody who has it, then you need to be very, very adamant you get your eyes checked. And again, you see a lot of us just go and get our eyes checked when there's a problem, and Ms. Marchak would talk about that. But don't. Do it on a regular interval. Diet. So again, I know we're all so busy. We're working hard. We're studying hard. Sometimes, yes, it's just quicker to go to get KFC and get a snack box for lunch than to maybe spend a Sunday packing your whole lunch for the rest of the week. But we've seen it time and time again, obesity is on the rise in all countries in the world. And so obesity is very strongly linked to a lot of eye diseases as well. But when we think about our diet, we should think about the ACE vitamins. So vitamin A, vitamin C, and vitamin E. And so vitamin A, we can think about eggs and fish and things like the green fruits, papaya, broccoli, avocado, green peppers, and then of course carrots and pumpkin and all that. And then vitamin C, of course, we have the citrus fruits, we have the kale, we have strawberries, etc. And then vitamin E, then again, things like avocados, mangoes, spinach, nuts, and different things. Now, one of the questions people ask us, well, look, you know, I don't have time for this. I'd rather just take a vitamin tablet and get it over and done with. But can't I just get a multivitamin and then get it done? Now, I mean, if you are extremely busy, stressed out, then, I mean, vitamin supplementation is something to think about. But... The body just doesn't need vitamins. It needs electrolytes, it needs protein, carbohydrates, all of those, and the vitamins aren't going to give you those as supplements. And then the other extreme, that if you are pretty good, at least having some fresh fruit a day, some type of eggs or cheese or fish, or anything like that, then if you do supplement yourself with vitamins, then the vast majority of time, that's just going down the toilet when you go to the bathroom, because the body is not that good at storing vitamins. And so if you know you're having a balanced diet and there is no need to supplement yourself with these almost sometimes expensive vitamins, but if you know your diet is bad for whatever reason, and you feel at this moment in time, you cannot change it, which you should, then there is that road to go that way. But they can be expensive. And again, there are easier ways and more enjoyable ways 
of having this lovely food rather than having the tablets. And it's not just that though, we need to think about other type of nutrition, an omega-3. So there's different types of omega-3, omega-3, omega-6, omega-9, but particularly number three. And this is very, very important again, not just for the eyes itself, but for people with dry eyes. So again, oily fish, so herring, mackerel, salmon, again, avocados, the seeds, and ask yourself, are you getting those? And again, sometimes we may not be a friend of fish eating, or we may not. But it is important to try to get the correct amount of quantity of this fresh food. Now, of course, we all love KFC. I'm not dissing KFC. But hopefully you can see KFC ain't the answer to everything, nor is doubles, nor is baker shark. And I'd have to admit, nor is pizza. But once we take things in moderation and not into extremes, and once we try to eat, eat a healthy, balanced diet, it's able to look after ourselves. But if we gorge on carbohydrates excessively and these high sugar foods, then you can see you'd have problems. And of course, the worst of that is diabetes. Again, hopefully, as the years go on, less and less and people are either not smoking at all, or they start smoking and then they stop smoking. But again, smoking has been connected to a lot of eye diseases, like hypertension or high blood pressure, and then changes to the sense of the part of the eye, the macula. And there's never a wrong time to stop smoking. So maybe your parents or your grandparents would say, nah, you know, I've been smoking for 15 years. What difference will it make? And again, this is where evidence and research is very, very important. Even if you stop smoking anytime, a year later and five years later, your body, your lungs and your eyes will thank you for it. No matter how long you have been smoking, that has been proven. So again, if you do know people who smoke and you wanna be a proactive healthcare or even friend, try to encourage people to stop smoking. Now it is difficult, remember tobacco is a drug, legalized and it does have very addictive properties so it isn't as simple as just telling someone to stop smoking just justify it understand the risks but like many other parts of the body from the toe to the top of the head smoking does have its problems and the eye is certainly one of those regular exercise now again, you say, no, come on, Sunday, it's a day of relaxation. But we're going to be finished here at around 3.30. That gives you another two and a half hours of daylight. Go outside, whether it's your garden, walk around the area, the savannah, Eddie Hart, whatever, a little bit of exercise. And again, not just for the eyes, but the overall energy levels, your muscle strength, and as I said, obesity has significant challenges for all of the systems of the body, and particularly the eyes again. It enhances your immune system. And also nowadays, particularly with all the stresses of COVID, it does show us to help improve mood. When you get the endorphins kicking in, when you walk around the block once, twice, put a little bit of effort into it. But even if you walk around your house or go outside, do a bit of gardening, it has been shown that it does make a difference, even walking up and down the stairs. And again, you see sometimes like diet, we think we have to change everything. We have to stop eating the KFC, etc. But no, just start off gently. As I said, even if it's walking around your house, walk around one way and then walk around the other way. That's a start. 
And like anything, we all have to start somewhere. We're not asking you to go around the savannah 15 times in an hour. I think all of us would be tired by then. But you will look better, you will feel better. And as I said, your mood will be much improved. Another thing that's very important, all of us who live in the Caribbean is UV protection. And like today, we have another glorious day of glorious sunshine outside. But given that we are so near the tropics, the amount of UV out there is huge compared to the likes of New York, Dublin, and other countries much northern than us. And so no matter what we do, I just put Maracas here as an example. But again, even if you are walking around the savannah area, Eddie Hart, or you're doing gardening, we should all have UV protection. Now, it's not the tint on your spectacles that gives the UV protection. It is actually another layer on your tinted spectacles that gives you UV protection. And that UV protection makes such a difference because if you have excessive UV, you'll get cataracts earlier and you can get changes to the back of the eyes. And that's why we should never look at the sun directly. And so again, a lot of people think, okay, we're gonna set out for Maracas and I go wear and wear my sunglasses. No problem. So someone said they don't like the tint and they asked the optometrist to take it off, but that's okay because they probably left on the UV protection. If you got your spectacles, we're gonna talk about that later, but if you got your spectacles from a, a reputable place, then all those lenses will have UV protection, particularly because we live in the Caribbean. So I wouldn't worry because it's not the tint that's giving you the UV protection. The tint is comfortable because the light can be very, very harsh. And any of you who are parents or grandparents do know that by the time someone is 18 years of age, we may have had up to 50% of our lifetime exposure to UV. Because think about it, kids go outside an awful lot more. A lot of the time when we work nowadays, we're stuck in offices. Kids have bigger pupils, so more sunlight gets into the back of the eyes. And so if you are a parent or a grandparent, again, the kids need UV protection. It's not just for us older folks, it's for everybody. But again, as optometrists, we can see, for example, people who are in the police force, people who are in, for example, the army, people who are farmers, people who are fisher folk, people who spend a lot of time outside, postal workers. You can almost recognize their careers because those eyes will look different if they don't use UV protection. Normally they have a bit of fatty tissue in the corner here, the white of the eye, and that's because of excessive UV protection, or excessive light not using UV protection. So again, listeners, no matter what you do, if you go out into the sun, even if it's for 15 minutes, you should have UV protection. If you go down to Charlotte Street and you buy a cheap pair of shades, it won't have the UV protection. It will have the tint, but it won't have the UV protection. And that will actually do you more damage because the tint will actually make your pupils open more, which means there's more light getting through. So it's not just the tint, it is the UV protection coating. So other parts of protection is eye protection. Now, a lot of people think eye protection is when we work in factories or when we work in the chemical plants, in Pint Lisa and different things. But maybe some of you or you know someone who likes to do woodwork as a hobby or metalwork, or maybe they fix cars. 
or maybe they do welding. All of those people should have eye protection because the little grind, the little shards, the little chips of wood can get into the eye and can cause nasty problems. But it doesn't even have to be that. Those of us who do gardening, those of us who do other hobbies, but there's a likelihood of something coming up and hitting the eye can be quite devastating. Now, again, I know some of you may have had lunch, so I won't show gory, gory details, but this could happen easily. Like in sports, when a squash ball or even a football can get to the eye and it can cause an awful lot of trouble. But all you have to do is go on the internet after today Make sure you have a strong stomach and look up eye trauma in woodwork, sports, gardening, and you'll see all types of things, pictures with nails in the eye, all types of horrible pictures. And again, it's those times that people think or wish we had a time machine because they wanna go back if only I was wearing eye protection. And unless one of you is holding on to a secret, we don't have a time machine. So let's not go, if only I could go backwards, let's not just go there in the first place. Wear eye protection. It doesn't hurt, it saves your vision. And again, Ms. Marchak is gonna talk about this after myself, but we nowadays, particularly, if we're not on the cell phone, we're on a laptop. If we're not on the laptop, we're looking at Netflix. And particularly for the last couple of months when we could not go outside because of COVID, et cetera, we've been looking at these artificial devices. The eye much rather would look out the garden or would much rather go to Shagaramas or go around the savannah, go around looking out into the wonder of the nature that we have in Sweet Tea and Tea. It would much rather just look into the distance. And she's gonna give you great advice on what to do about that. And then the last thing in relation to eye care is use your contact lens properly. So some of you in the audience may be using contact lenses. And again, if you don't use them properly, you are gonna have a problem. So that makes us go on to the next one. What is basic contact lens health and hygiene? And again, it, Listeners, if you have any questions, you can send them private chat. You can put them in the chat. People have been sending me questions, so thank you so much. We don't have to wait till the end. We can go along. Now, again, on the left, the poor gentleman who has a significant contact lens infection. And then in the middle is a very dirty contact lens. And on the right, a very dirty contact lens case. And then on the right, you have a very dirty contact lens. And none of this should happen. And I'm gonna show you some basic tips on what to do if you're wearing contacts or maybe you know someone who's wearing contacts. And unfortunately, as we're gonna talk about later, the internet is full of a lot of misinformation. And that's why we're so happy that all of you are here today to get this education so we won't have people like the poor gentleman on the left. So the first thing is wash your hands. Whenever you're dealing with contact lenses, wash your hands. So that's the funny thing about COVID. People started becoming obsessed with washing their hands. And you know, what's the optometrist? We're like, we've been doing that since we qualified. It's built into us, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. And even now, when you're waiting to go into Massey's True Value, Extra Foods, whatever, you see people just literally whoosh, put their hand on the tap for one second and somehow they think they've washed their hands. So this isn't anything new. This is not because of COVID. This is always the way with contacts. Remember, you're going near your eye, the most sensitive organ in your body, so you need to wash your hands. Again, don't fall asleep with your contact lenses. So there's another 
interesting picture for you. Just by falling this free pitocondic lenses, anywhere between 20 times to 35 times more likely to get an eye infection. And some of you may say, aren't there special contact lenses for falling this free pin? And yes, there are. But we would normally just use those for people like that in the police force, in the army, medical doctors, people who, who have to be on call and get up suddenly. And even though there are special lenses to fall asleep in, this risk doesn't go away. As soon as you close your eyes and fall asleep, the risks increase. So what's the best thing to do? Just don't fall asleep with your lenses. It's not worth the risk. We've only been given one pair of eyes. And if you lose this eye, you've only got one eye left. And as Biomi says, I've been an optometrist for quite a while. And even to this day, I probably fitted only less than 10 people with contacts that they can fall asleep with. And because they were in the army, medical doctors, etc. And they understood the risk, but the risk never goes away. So don't let yourself fall asleep in contact lenses. It's just not worth the risk. Now, again, for some of you, you may have those contact lenses that you get away after every use called daily disposables. And if that's the case, you don't have to worry about solutions. And that's the vast benefit of single use lenses or daily disposable lenses. You just wear them once and throw them away. But if you do have two weekly lenses or monthly lenses, and this is the proper way, again, no matter what the internet says, this is the proper way. So you should always start off with the right eye, making sure that you keep a system that way. You take off the lens and you pour two or three drops of the solution and you need to rub, rub the lenses for at least 20 seconds, making sure you have both sides done. And a lot of patients forget to do the rubbing step. But think about it, that gets rid of any the grime, the grease, anything that you've collected up. Then you should rinse off the lenses with the solution and then you put the contact lens in to a dry contact lens case. Fill it up completely with fresh solution. Make sure it's new solution and don't top off the solution. Don't use the old solution and pour a new solution on top of it. That's going to cause a nightmare. Then do the same thing for the left eye and then fall asleep four to eight hours, depending on what brand you should do. But the two biggest errors that people make, one is not doing the rubbing step, and two, not using fresh solution every time. Now, again, people say, oh, but if I use fresh solution every time, it means I'm going to go through the solution quicker, and that's going to cost me more money. Okay. You cannot put a price on your eyes. And remember, we don't have a time machine. So all those dollars you're saving allegedly by not using fresh solution is not going to help you when you've lost your vision. It's just not worth the risk, and we see it considerably. So then the next day or the next time you use them, again, wash your hands, start off with the right lens, examine it, making sure that it's in good condition. Make sure it's the correct way around, put it into the eyes. And then again, this is what a lot of people don't know. That once the lens is settled, then you should throw away the solution that's in that case. You shouldn't leave it in the case at all. Then you should rinse out the case. Then you should tissue it dry with a lint-free tissue, and then you should let it air dry. So basically, if there's no lens in the case, there should be no solution in the case. The only time you should put solution in is just before you take off the lenses. Now, does this take a little bit of time? Well, yes. But again, this is time to prevent you from getting an eye infection 
and losing your vision. Now, some of you may say, well, I've been wearing contact lenses for the last 10 years and nothing's happened so far, and I don't even follow these instructions. Well, just call yourself lucky because that's the thing about corneal infections, eye infections. It's waiting for that time to invade your eye and make you lose your vision. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. And again, never, ever, ever, never, ever, ever, never use tap water. Tap water never comes into this. And so there's a story here of the woman in the United States. She's using tap water. And then you end up with a nasty eye as it is in the right there. Because there's a little bug in everybody's tap water, whether it's Trinidad, whether it's the Caribbean, the United States, Ireland, wherever. And it's a very nasty bug. And once it gets into your eye, you can lose your vision in 72 hours. And it lives in the water, in our rivers, in the sea. And so that's why water and contact lenses never mix. You should never store your contacts in water, nor should you be in the sea with water or the river or the hot tub or the sauna because it is a risk of you having this bug in your eye. So as I say, you don't mix water with contacts. There's never a reason to use water with contacts. Get rid of your case regularly. And again, maybe some of you don't do this and you end up with dirty cases like this. And it often surprises me when people come visit me, they bring cases like this as if they're proud of it. And I'm almost afraid to touch it because God knows what's in it. And ideally, we should get rid of it every 30 days. So like this nice saying, it's dirty and dirty. And if you don't want to get rid of it every 30 days, then every 90 days at maximum, which is three months. And a lot of the times when you buy the contact lens solutions, you get the little cases. It depends which ones you're buying. But just think about it, people. This is where your contact lens stays overnight. I mean, you wouldn't want to be in a bath of water like that. Think about what it would do to your skin. And yet this is a contact lens that you're going to put in the next day and it's sitting in the case like that. Now, one of the people in the audience also talked about expiry of the contact lenses. And that's true. Get rid of the contact lenses as recommended. So if it is a two weekly lens, get rid of it every two weeks. It's not two weeks of wear, it's like milk. You open up a carton of milk, you've got X number of days to do it. Use it, drink it or leave it in the fridge until it begins to smell. So whether you drink the milk or leave it there, well, something's gonna happen. And it's the same with the contacts. You open it up, you have two weeks to use it. You open it up, you have month, one month to use it, depending on what different type of contacts it is. It's not a month of wear. So I wore it once this month, I wore it three times that month, I wore it four times this month, and then you add it up until it hits 30. No, it's like, as I said, any food. You open it up and you have two weeks to wear it. Whether you wore it once in that week or all the time in those two weeks, you get rid of it in two weeks. Again, these are your eyes. I'm amazed when people try to do things just to save a little bit of money. But then when you have to go to hospital, for someone to save your eyesight, it ain't gonna be just a little dollars. It ain't gonna be even hundred dollars. It's gonna be thousands of dollars. So that's $5, $10 you save by not using the solution correctly or not using the contacts correctly. And then you end up with a nasty eye infection. It's not worth the gamble. You're better off doing the lottery. It is just not worth the gamble. And again, as you can see, a recurrent theme is to visit your optometrist regularly. Now, particularly when you're wearing contacts, your optometrist will tell you to come back 
time and time again. And you may feel, oh, I don't want to come back. Oh, I have to drive. I have to find a car parking space. I have to do this. I have to do that. But at the end of the day, do you remember you're putting a piece of plastic into your contact, into your eyes? And so you have to be very careful that even though you may think it's working perfectly, it may not be. And that's why we use a machine like this that magnifies the front of your eyes so we can see the very, very fine details. Overall, contact lens use is very safe. There's billions of people in the world wearing contacts and the vast majority of them don't get eye infections because they listen to what the optometrist has told them. It's just not worth it trying to save a couple of dollars and then end up with an eye infection. And then the last thing I'm gonna talk about today and again, if you have any questions about what we've just been talking about for the last two topics, is why we believe you should go to the optometrist and get your spectacles compared to why some people buy them online. Now, this is not the same as saying that you have to buy it where you got your eyes examined. And as you'll see, we're going to recommend that you should ask around and see where do people recommend you go. That we would definitely recommend. This is when people go online and buy their spectacles. And I think a lot of you are going to be very shocked when you hear what happens online and what doesn't happen online. And again, it's all about understanding, educating, and that's why I'm happy that we're here, so you'd know what exactly happens. Now, everybody, you might have heard about this one, pupillary distance, which is the distance between your two eyes. Now, this is crucial when you want to get spectacles, because you hopefully want to get the center of your spectacle lens in front of your eyes. And I do say hope because you don't know what's happening online. And a lot of these things, when you go to these big companies in the States or the UK, it's all done by robots. There's no human interaction from the start until they get into the delivery box. There's nobody. So if any mistakes happen, then no one's going to pick it up. And optometrists get a lot of requests to give me my PD, please. And again, some of you may be shocked to hear this, but it's not part of your prescription. It's not part of your prescription in the United Kingdom. It's not part in Australia. It's not part in Africa. The only place it's part of is some places, even some places in the United States. This is a measurement that not everybody can take. And it certainly should not be done by yourselves. And it certainly should not be done online. Because if this measurement is not taken correctly, then your lenses will not be in front of the center of your eyes. And if it's not in front of the center of your eyes, then you're gonna end up with all types of problems, headaches, distortion, nausea, all types of things. And because of that, some optometrists charge if you want the PD, and so they should, because it is a professional service. It is a professional service. Now, again, I want you to think about it. A good pair of spectacles should last you at least two years. Now, you may go online and buy perfume, and we go online and buy food. And then we use the perfume for a couple of months and then it empties. And then of course we stuff ourselves with the pizza. And then three hours later, we're hungry. 
But this is going to be something you're going to want to spend money on quality because it's meant to last you for two years. But imagine ending up with a pair of spectacles where the centers are here instead of in front of your eyes. And look at these two examples I found on the internet. So this is in the public domain. I don't know who she is, but she was on a form and she wanted to know, can you tell me if my spectacles are too big? Yeah. And so I think any of you, even those of you who are not optometry students have a look at this. I mean, she didn't really need to ask because these frames are too wide. And so this is where the middle of a lens is. And this is where the middle of this lens is. So you can see she is not looking through the middle of her lenses. And more than likely, she's going to end up with headaches or distortion or different things. So whoever ended up giving her these frames or she got them online, she didn't want to say, you can see that this is not going to work out well for her. And then, of course, this is another example of a frame then that's too small. And this is where, as I'm going to show you later on, I know it seems cheaper, I know it seems easier, but it doesn't make any sense buying your spectacles online at all. Because how are you going to know how it fits? And tomorrow, if you go to university, if you go to work, or you go to Massey, if you go to KFC, have a look around. Some of us are tall, some of us are small. Some of us have big heads, some of us have small heads. Some of them have long heads, some of us have short heads. How do you know it's gonna fit you? And this is not gonna be like a pair of trousers or a pair of high heels that you just tolerate for two or three hours because you want to look good. You're going to wear these for the next two years of your life. And it's digging in your nose or it's digging around your ears. Just doesn't make sense. But it's not just about the PD. A lot of people, the pupillary distance, a lot of people talk about that. But look at all this. There's this thing called the pantoscopic tilt. And that's the angle of your spectacles in the front of your face. And this angle, again, needs to be a certain way. You're never gonna check that online. And it's different frame after different frame after different frame is different upon different individuals. So how it fits me, how it fits you, whether we go for frame A or frame B, are very, very different. Here's another one, the wrap of the frame, the curvature of the frame, and the shape of your head. How is that compared to yours? Again, you're never going to be able to measure this online. So how is it following the curve of your head? And again, tomorrow, look at lots of people and you'll see everybody has different curvature. The distance from the back of the frame to your eye, which is called the back vertex distance. Again, that depends, different people, different frames. How it fits on me will be different than how it fits on you. And if you're over 40, it gets even worse because you either have to have bifocals and there has to be a measurement to where the bifocal, the little window goes. And you may say, well, I'm going for those fancy progressives. But even then you have to take a measurement and you can't do that online, not accurately. Again, you need a professional to do that. And again, I think we all have to be honest with each other. I see my sister-in-law buying things online, and then she goes to Grand Bazaar, she meets a complete stranger, hands over cash, all types of strangeness. And then she's all excited, she gets to dress, and then she goes home, and it looks like nothing that the pictures show. 
It's either a different shape, a different color, and it never even fits her. It's too big or too small. Then she has to ring the woman up again. Then they all meet back in Grand Bazaar. She gets another color. She goes back. It still doesn't know the whole thing's a disaster. But now she's too embarrassed to ask for a refund. And now she has a dress that no one wants to wear. And again, the same with people buying shoes online. Why would we ever end up doing that? And I think that's happened to all of us. You got burnt once or twice by buying things online. Some things it works out well, some things it doesn't, which is one of those is spectacles. And you may say, yes, but the spectacles are much cheaper online. But I have seen many places that are advertising very good spectacles with good value. So ask around. Make sure they're qualified. Make sure they're licensed under the Teach Your Worth C. And as of next year, you'll all be able to go online and see which ones are the qualified stores and which ones are acting illegally. Because it's getting so bad, there's lots of illegal people out there, listeners. If you're in doubt, ask them to show you that they are on the licensing body. I know a phrase, there's a lot of, you know, bait and switch. There's a phrase advertising this and that and this and get spectacles. And the ad said 1,200. And then when they went in, it all added up to 3,200. So you've got to be very, very careful. Read the fine print. People promising this and promising that. And then when you get there, they suck you in. When you buy online, you probably don't get a warranty with the frame. But what happens if it mashes up? What happens if the nose pads fall off? What happens if the arms fall off or the little plastic here? The people online don't care. And it's funny, a lot of people say, oh, the optometrist, all they care about is money. And I think if you've really thought about it, you know that isn't true. It's the online companies. That's all they care about is money. Remember, it's a pure robot making this. There's no love into it. There's no TLC as it is when it's done locally. And if your frame, nose pads fall off, or if the arms fall off, you have a warranty if you buy it locally. Online, they're not going to care. They've taken your credit card details and off they go. And also think about it online. You're not even sure it's a Gucci frame. You're not even sure it's a Ray-Ban. And I see a lot of people buying these frames online and it's a Ray-Ban, but they don't get a Ray-Ban case or they don't get a Ray-Ban crot. So that means it's probably a real old Ray-Ban, five years old, that's going cheap, cheap, cheap because no one wants it. It's out of fashion. Or you ended up with a Gucci that's spelled with a C instead of a G. Or you've ended up with a Prada that has a B instead of a P. Now you're too embarrassed to wear it out because everybody see it ain't a Prada. It looked like that on the screen because you couldn't zoom in. You gotta wonder why is it so, so cheap? It's probably the end of the line or it's counterfeit or of course poor quality. Again, there's nothing as exciting as trying on an actual frame. Remember what we said, is it hurting the nose? Is it hurting the ears? How is it face drop? How's the distance behind it, et cetera. So let our optician do it, a qualified optician. This is something you're gonna have for two years. You don't wanna be embarrassed by it because it's too big or too small or you're getting a headache so you keep falling down steps. And particularly if you have a high prescription, the special coatings optician can give you, the special materials optician can give you to make it look beautiful. But you won't know that when you're buying it online. You're gonna end up with tick, 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 tick spectacles. And also when you're putting the prescription in, I have seen so many patients come back and they put the wrong thing. They've put a five instead of a two. They put a minus instead of a positive. They've mixed up the right eye with the left eye. And as you'll see in a second, they come back, well, what am I meant to do? And it's sad. 
but you're going to have to start all over again because you put the two in instead of the five, etc. But this is one study, but there's several studies. Study the difference between spectacles paid for online and spectacles done face to face. And listen up, 75% of the spectacles online were wrong. So three out of every four were wrong. Either the fit was incorrect, so it was tilted or came too far off, or the wrong color. It was causing pinching of the ears or the nose. The PD, as I told you, wasn't correct. The heights for the bifocals or the progressives wasn't correct, so people were falling down. The prescription itself was wrong, or they ended up with the frame, as I said, being tilted, and they ended up with prismatic effect. Now, when things like this happen, who's going to deal with it? And a lot of you will go back to the optometrist and say, hey, my spectacles are wrong, and blame us. Now, if it's done locally, and then we can, sure, we can go back and talk to the lab. But if it's done online, and we check the prescription, tick. We check the measurements, tick. And there's still a problem. You really think the online company is going to care? They've done and dusted you. They've forgotten about you. They're just rubbing their hands, happy they got a couple of hundred out of you. And so is it really cheaper in the long run? Because you've now got a pair of spectacles that gives you headaches, makes you fall over, looks a disaster, and now you're gonna to have to go back and get a proper pair of spectacles. And that was just one study that I showed you. There are studies again and again and again, 75%, 80% of spectacles are not correct and paid for online. It's just not worth it. You know it seems nice, but even think about import duty, the online sales tax, you have to pay in US. None of that happens when you buy locally. I often see the daughter goes, lives in the States or Canada, and then they send down a frame for granny or mummy. And then the frame ends up like this or wrong color, wrong shape. Spectacle frame buying needs to be a personal job. And it needs to be done by a professional. This is not like ordering pizza online. And you end up with half of it with pineapple and the other half with pepperoni because of a mistake. You might still eat it. This is your vision. This is your eyes and something that's going to last for two years. It's not just about the PD and it just ain't about the money. There are several locations in Sweet Tea and Tea that have very good value added onto them. Good quality frames, good quality lenses. All you have to do is ask around. So I thank you for your time to listen to me. And again, if you have any questions now or later on, I will be here for the rest of the afternoon. And again, I'd like to thank you all for being here. And I'd like to thank Yomi as president for doing a great job and her colleagues in the TTUSA for giving me this invitation. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much, Sue. Um, are there any questions? If there are any questions, you can ask now and um, we'll forward it to Mr. Farnan. We'll just leave the floor open for two minutes in case anyone has it. Okay, so
Okay, so we're going to move on now. So I would like to introduce our second speaker and final as well for today, Ms. Stephanie Marchak. So Ms. Stephanie Marchak has been an optometrist with Ferrara Optical for the last eight years and also has experience in screening for both cataracts and refractive surgery. She studied at the University of Manchester and practiced in the United Kingdom for two years before returning to Trinidad in 2015. She has previously sat on the executive committee for the Trinidad and Tobago Optometrist Association and is currently on the Trinidad and Tobago Opticians Registration Council. So I'd just like to welcome Ms. Marcha. Oh, sorry, we're not hearing you. If you can unmute your mic. That was embarrassing. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Kiyomi. Um, I am Stephanie Macha. So first of all, I just want to thank the Optometry Student Association for inviting me to speak here today. Um, thanks to Niall for um, starting us off on such a great note. And thanks to all of you for joining us here on this webinar today. So the theme for World Sight Day this year was Love Your Eyes. So today I'm just going to talk about a few topics just in keeping with that theme. So I'm going to talk about the importance of having a routine eye exam, um, symptoms from digital device use and what you can do to resolve it, and just go through some fun facts about vision like Niall said earlier. So um, I will apologize one time because my PowerPoint does not have as many photos as Niall's did. Um, so it's a lot of words, but hopefully my voice and the content is enough to keep you guys interested. Um, so let's start with the importance of having regular eye exams. So I don't know if I can get this to work. Right. So first of all, before we go into why having an eye exam is important, um, I thought it would be good to go through exactly what we do in an eye exam in the first place. Um, there might be some people in here who um, have never had an eye exam before. Um, a lot of people tend to not have one because they're just a little nervous about um, what goes on in an eye exam. So hopefully um, this will help a little bit and encourage more people to go in for an eye test. So the first thing that we need to do is take a history. So before we actually do anything at all, um, we need to get an idea of why you're here in the first place. So we just ask a few questions just to sort of get to know you a little bit better. So um, what kind of problems you're having, um, if you've had any eye problems before, and just to get a picture of your general health and your family history. And the point of us getting all this information is not to be fast and map all your business, but we need to get this information to tailor your eye test so that we can help you in the best way that you can. Because everybody's different, so everyone's going to have a different problem, okay? So the thing that we do next are some preliminary tests. So this is basically for us to just see what we're dealing with. So how good or how bad your vision is um, to start with. And just to make sure, you know, your eyes are lined up straight and they're working together. Um, we check the pressure inside your eye, um, you know, just to make sure that everything is working how it should be working, right? Um, and then next up, and I would say that this is the most important part of the eye exam, and that is checking the health of your eye. So we will look at the front and at the back of your eye as well, um, under a microscope and a bright light. And that's just to make sure that all the different parts of the eye are in good working condition and are working properly together, because that plays a really big part in helping you see clearly. And then we will check the, to see if you have a prescription and if you actually need glasses. So this is the part that most people are going to remember about their eye test. So it's the part where you're like, is it better with one or better with two? And then you think it looks the same and you think we're trying to trick you, but no, that is not the case at all. What we are trying to do is just get an idea of what your prescription is. Right. And then we take all of the information that we have gotten from all these different parts of the test, and then we put it together for you to be able to give you the best advice and what steps you need to take next. So whether that's getting glasses or going to see, um, or being referred to see an ophthalmologist. So that is the purpose of the eye test, right? So 
why is it so important to have an eye exam in the first place? So a lot of people think that the only reason they need to do an eye test is to see if they need glasses. Now that's true. I mean, that's why most people will, why most patients will decide to come in because they're having trouble seeing. I mean, that seems pretty obvious, right? But even if you are seeing everything okay, um, and you don't need to wear glasses, it's still good to have regular exams so we can get a baseline of what is normal for you in case anything changes. So for example, if you always, you know, you, always, you know somebody who always saying like they have a bad eye, so somebody's vision who is not that good to begin with, and they come year after year, and every year the vision is not great, but it's the same, it's not changing, then I'm not worried about it. But if somebody who has always had very good vision suddenly comes in and they're not seeing properly, then that is something we need to investigate a little bit further, right? Um, now, like I said earlier, an eye exam is also very important to check the health of your eye. So the reason for that is because a lot of eye exams tend to sneak up on you because they don't have any symptoms. And symptoms are the way that most patients will be able to tell if something is wrong. So for example, if you're still seeing okay, and you're not getting any pain, you're not feeling anything, then you're not going to know that something is wrong. Um, and then some eye problems also run in families. So that means that your chance of getting that condition is automatically higher. So a good example of this uh, would be glaucoma. So now I talked a little bit about glaucoma earlier. Um, I'm just gonna briefly kind of summarize it. Um, glaucoma is an eye condition that damages the nerve at the back of the eye, the optic nerve, and that can lead to vision loss if it's not picked up and is treated early. Now, the thing with glaucoma is that it has no symptoms in the early stages, and it's also hereditary. So meaning if somebody in your family has glaucoma, you're about 10 times more at risk for developing that as yourself. Um, and then you wouldn't know if you had glaucoma because you're not going to get any symptoms. Um, and the only way glaucoma can be detected or picked up is during an eye exam, because that is where we as an, we are as optometrists are going to look at the back of the eye in, on, in more detail and be able to pick that up for you. So again, eye exams are just really important to make sure that the health of your eye is okay. It's also really good for your general health to have regular eye exams. Um, having an eye test can actually help to monitor or even pick up conditions like high blood pressure and diabetes because these conditions affect the blood vessels that are inside of your body. And that would include the blood vessels that are at the back of your eyes, which is again, something we look at when you're having an eye test. So if you have uncontrolled or undiagnosed high blood pressure or diabetes, um, it is possible to pick that up during a routine eye exam because the blood vessels are gonna look a little bit different. So they might, they might look a little curvy because typically the blood vessels go nice and straight. Um, or we can even see hemorrhages around the back of the eye. Niall showed us a picture of that earlier. Now that was quite extreme, um, but sometimes the hemorrhages just look like little dots. And again, you're not gonna know that that is going on behind your eye. Right um, now, so just to kind of recap, it's important to have an eye exam to see if you need glasses, to get a baseline of what's normal, to make sure your eyes are healthy, and if you're developing, uh, if you're at risk for developing any conditions, and it can act as a good screener for general health conditions, right? Now, how often should you actually have an eye exam? Now, now I went over this as well, but I'm going to go over it again. So the recommended recall time for an eye exam is every two years, but of course there are exceptions to every rule um, and that applies to this as well. So it really depends on the patient. So there are certain groups of patients that we do recommend for them to have an eye test every year instead of every two years. And that would be children and teenagers up to 17 years old. Um, the reason for that being that children and teenagers are growing. So, you know, as they're growing, their eyes are growing, which means that their prescriptions are changing. So that's something we need to monitor a little more regularly than just every two years, right? Another group of patients will be diabetic patients, and I said this earlier as well, but people who have diabetes need to have an eye exam every year so we can pick up on any diabetic changes that are happening. Um, and even those with eye conditions or complications that need to be monitored. So for example, patients with glaucoma, patients with cataracts, um, they need to be seen every year as well. And then people with a family history of glaucoma or any other eye conditions that run in families, then you would also need to test every year as well. So we can just follow up and make sure that everything is okay. Um, also, I didn't put this on the slide, but anybody over 60, I know now says 75, I would say 60, but I mean, you're just being extra cautious. I think 60 is a good age to start coming every year as well, right? 
Um, now, I'm sorry, but I can't, I, my cursor, I can't see my cursor, so I can't go in the chat. So if there are any questions there, can anyone let me know, please? Um, but I mean, please feel free to ask. I can maybe check it at the end if anyone has any questions now, right? Now, I just spent the last 15 minutes or five minutes or so trying to convince all of you why you should incorporate eye exams into your rotation of checkup. So, you know, you go to the doctor, you go to the dentist, ladies, you get your eyelashes done, you get your nails done, you not really a checkup, but just another appointment that you have to do. So you should incorporate your eye exams into that as well. Um, but honestly, over the last year and a half, I have actually noticed more and more people coming in on their own. Um, and I'm sure you can guess why that is, um, you know, online school, you're working from home. Um, when we couldn't line, you know, when we couldn't go out anywhere, everybody was doing video calls. Like, I don't know if you all downloaded House Party. That was an app that everyone had that we were, everyone was trying to have a virtual line. Um, so basically, we're just spending more and more time on screens which in turn will lead to more strain on our eyes. So let's talk now about eye strain and digital devices. So spending more time on screens can lead to a group of problems known as computer vision syndrome. Um, so if you're using your device for a little while, so if you're using your laptop or your tablet or your phone for a long time, and you feel like, your eyes are pulling or they're watering a lot or they feel gritty, um, you're getting headaches, you may be getting blurry vision. These are all symptoms of computer vision syndrome, right? Now, why do we get computer vision syndrome? So the simple answer is, you know, when you're on a device, is the reason why we get these symptoms is because of the habits that we have while we are using the devices. So the simple solution to this is just to change your habits. So let's go over a couple of the habits that we can incorporate into our daily lifestyle. So the first thing, and I talk about this a lot, <laughs> pretty much like every patient I see. So let's say 10 patients a day, I'm talking about this. The first thing you need to do is the 20, 20, 20 rule. So every 20 minutes, you look at something 20 feet away for 20 seconds. And the reason for this is to relax your eye muscles in between long stretches of close work. So when you look at something that's close to you, your eyes have to work a lot harder than when you look at something that's far away. So if you're looking at something close up all the time, your eye muscles, they constrict, they get very tight. So it's very hard for them to get back into that nice relaxed state uh, when you're finished doing your close work. So by taking the break regularly, you're relaxing the muscles in between, and it's easier to then just, you know, when you're, when you're done your near work, you can just look up into the distance normally. Um, think about it like this. You could run around the savannah straight. Maybe that'll take you about, what, 30 minutes if you're super fit, um, maybe less. And, but if you stopped and you took breaks along the way, you probably not feel so winded by the end of it, right? Um, another addition to this rule um, is the 20, 20, 22 rule, which is the same thing, essentially. So every 20 minutes, you look at something 20 feet away for 20 seconds. And every two hours, you get up and you physically walk away from the screen to actually make sure you're looking at something in the distance, right? If you take the break and you look at something close in between, you're basically defeating the purpose of this whole exercise, right? The second thing you can do is just blink a little bit more. So blinking helps to keep your eyes moist, which in turn is going to make them more comfortable, right? Now, when you're on a device, now this is not an attack on anybody here. This is just a general statement. When you're on devices, you do not blink very much. That is a fact. You just stare. It's very easy to do that. And because blink blinking is like an automatic reflex, you're not, really a, you're not really conscious. You just assume that you're doing it. But when you're staring at a screen for a long time, you actually don't blink very much. And if you're not blinking very much, that means the tears are not washing over your eyes, which means that they're going to feel dry. Similarly, if you're not blinking, then if your, your tears might start to pool up and then they might just water run down your face. So that's why your eyes will feel gritty or that's why they might get watery. So just simply by increasing your blink rate by being conscious and blinking a little bit more, that can make a big difference to your screen time. Um, if that's not enough, which sometimes it isn't, you can just use your wetting drops as well during your screen time. Just make sure you're using a good rewetting drop that's actually going to combat the moisture um, and combat the dryness. Um, drops like Visine um, and Clear Eyes, those aren't really the best for dryness because those are really vasoconstrictors, which means that they're just going to kind of make the blood vessels in the eyes small on the white part of the eye smaller, which means that you know the redness is going to go away. Great, um, but it's not actually going to tackle the root cause of the problem, which is the dryness. Okay, so that's why we would recommend other drops. So good brands would be like Refresh Tears, um, Sustain, 
ultra is a good one as well, right? Um, so that's what you can do. So you blink a little bit more and you can use your wetting drops as well. Another good thing is to make sure you have a good working distance, an appropriate working distance. So when you're using a computer, just make, oh, a, a laptop, um, you just want to make sure that you're about, about an arm's length um, or about 50 centimeters away. My arms are actually, I'm pretty short, so my arms are actually about 50 centimeters, so I kind of use that as a good guide. But a little further away is okay too. Um, if you're using a phone or a tablet, try to make sure it's about 40 to 50 centimeters as well. You don't want it like up in your face like this, right? Um, another thing you can do is make sure that the screen brightness is not too high. You want to lower the brightness of the screen. Or you could even try switching to night mode. So the reason why night mode is so good is because it's black. It's a black screen with white writing um, in most cases. Um, that, that's how the night mode looks. So then that way there's less, there's less light coming out at you from the screen. Um, if you do all those, if you lower the brightness and you have night mode and you still find it's a little glary, you can get a matte screen protector that might help. Um, and that's just, it's like what you would put on your phone, you stick it over your laptop screen um, and that should help as well. The only downside to that is that um, sometimes some people find if they're doing fine detail like on Excel or a spreadsheet or something, it can kind of distort like certain numbers like an eight and a zero, six and a nine, that kind of thing. So it's just something you want to, you just do what's best for you, but those are the options that are there. And it's also really good to note that good lighting when you're using devices is also very important. So you don't want your only light source to be the light coming from the screen. Right. So you want to make sure you have good general light. So you have the light above you on. You can have a task light as well. So an extra lamp that comes like next to whatever you're doing. That's why it's called task lighting. Um, and that's going to help your eyes out so they don't have to concentrate so much on just one piece of light, which is coming from the screen. Right. Another thing you can do is also angle the screen to avoid glare from overhead lighting um, and windows. Um, so I mean, just, just to kind of, I know this is a lot, so I'm just going to recap it briefly. So you want to make sure you take regular breaks. You want to blink a lot when you're using screens. You want to have a good distance when you're using your screen. Don't have the screen too bright and just make sure you have good lighting in your area. Okay. Now, what about, now I've gone through all of these ways to improve your screen habits and you might be wondering, well, I mean, she missed a pretty obvious one, right? Like what about glasses? Like, isn't that what she does in the first place. Now, of course, yes, if you have been prescribed glasses by your optometrist, so whether it was for general use or if it was um, just specifically for the computer, of course, yes, please wear the glasses. Um, if that's what you've been told to do, by all means, you wear the glasses when you're using your device. Um, and if you don't need prescription glasses, then the steps above should be enough to help you, but you have to be consistent with those things. So basically, if you do it, if you decide, right, I'm going to do all these things right now, you're going to try it for a day and then you might feel well this didn't help at all but you have to keep doing it every day every time you use the device so you have to be very consistent and keep showing up when you're doing these habits right now this brings me to my next topic which is you know i'm sure everybody has seen all of these ads on facebook and on instagram for these special glasses that are going to block blue light that comes from your devices now these glasses seem to be doing the absolute most, right? So they're going to improve your sleep. They're going to prevent eye disease. They're going to reduce your eye strain. So a lot of big claims here, but just remember, like I said before, digital eye strain is caused by how we use our devices, not the blue light that comes out of it, right? So what I'm going to do now is just go through some facts about blue light that maybe might help you a little bit, maybe make you a little more reassured because I know they're really kind of, they're really pushing this blue light thing over here. So first of all, blue light does come from devices. That's a fact, right? Nobody is debating that at all. And yes, the blue light that comes from those devices is not the best blue light for you. That is also true, right? But the amount that comes from a screen is very small. So there's, no actual, there's actually no clinical evidence to date that actually says it will harm the eye. Now they're still doing research, of course, that might change, but for now, there's nothing that actually says it's going to be harmful to the eye. Secondly, the largest source of blue light is actually the sun. So, I mean, we all love being in the sun, right? I mean, you all remember going to the beach. I mean, I'm pretty sure that if we weren't here today at this webinar, you guys might all be there right now. Um, but just to put things into perspective, you get the same amount of blue light from being in the sun for 15 minutes as you would for being on a screen for 12 hours. 
Now, I'm not encouraging anybody here to be on a screen for 12 hours a day, um, but just to let you know, even spending that amount of time on one is not exposing you to as much blue light as you think, right? Just remember that, 15 minutes in the sun is the same as 12 hours on a screen, right? Now, lastly, our bodies actually need blue light, right? So blue light is what helps to maintain our natural sleep-wake cycle and it even improves our mood, you know? That's why being in the sun is so nice. Um, now, it is true that the more blue light you are exposed to, it's going to reduce the release of melatonin, which is the hormone that induces sleep. So in other words, the more blue light you're exposed to, it makes you more alert and more awake, which is why you're awake in the day. I would think most of you are. You're more awake in the day because you're more exposed to, you're exposed to more blue light from the sun, so your body will stay up, right? Um, but you know what you can do instead of buying a pair of glasses with a blue light blocker to help with that is you can just turn off your phone an hour before bed, set it to night mode, set it to do not disturb, um, and that's going to help improve your sleep pattern as well. Now, even now, I've gone through a lot of things here. Now, even if after all this, you still want to be cautious and you still want to get a blue light blocker anyway, because you just you just want to be extra safe. That's absolutely fine. That's no problem at all. That is your choice, right? But please just make sure that if you are going to get a blue light blocker, that you are getting it from a reputable provider so that your blue light blocker is actually doing what it says it's going to do, which is to block blue light, right? Also remember that any trusted eye care professional is going to prescribe based on the on what is in the best interest of you, their patient. We are not going to tell you to get something that you do not need or that is not going to fit into your lifestyle. So please just keep that in mind as well, right? Now, I know I've gone through a lot of information here. Um, I know it's been quite a lot, um, but I just thought I would end on some fun facts about the eyes like now said I would do. So there's just about three facts here, so nothing too much. But this one I found quite interesting. So if the human eye were a digital camera, it would be 576 megapixels. Now I haven't used a digital camera in years, so I can't remember if that is good. I would assume that is good, not super techy. So I actually looked it up. Um, and just to put into perspective again, the camera quality of an iPhone 12 Pro Max is 12 megapixels. So if you thought your camera phone quality was good, your eye is about 50 times better than that, right? So that would also explain why if you, when you're looking at scenery, you know, you're trying to take a picture of something and you realize like, why is it not looking as good as how I see it? I mean, that's how I think anyway. And that's probably why, because your eye has a way higher resolution than any camera will be able to have, right? Um, this is not necessarily a fun fact, but I thought it was useful in the theme of loving your eyes and, you know, eye protection. Um, your eyes can actually get sunburned. So this is called photokeratitis, and it happens when your cornea becomes damaged or irritated from just being exposed to too much UV light, right? Now, this will typically happen from surface reflection. So, you know, from white sand beaches and crystal clear waters that we don't necessarily have in Trinidad, but we do have of the islands in the Caribbean. Um, even if you are, you know, you travel and you're going skiing or snowboarding, the reflection from the snow can do that as well. That's why you always see skiers wearing these thick goggles. Um, it's not just for fashion, it's also for protection. Um, you can also get uh, photokeratitis from a solar eclipse. So they always tell you don't look directly at the sun, far less a solar eclipse. That is why it could actually damage your eye. Um, similarly with tanning beds, I know we probably don't do that here, but you know, if you ever saw anyone going into a tanning bed, that's why they give those goggles because they want to protect your eyes from the UV that it's exposing you to, to get the tan in the first place. Um, even arc welders, and I mentioned this before, a really common um, eye injury uh, with welders is arc eye. I've seen lots of welders and when I ask them about it, they're just like, yeah, I get out all the time. And I'm like, okay. So, you know, to each his own, but you did that, but that is why you should always wear eye protection when you're outdoors. So sunglasses or transition lenses, or even in hazardous conditions. And like Niall said earlier, hazardous, is, I don't necessarily mean like super danger, but I mean, you know, if you're doing a DIY project at home, you know, you like to do, you have to fix, like do any plumbing or um, you like to paint, um, anything like that. Uh, or if your work environment exposes you to things like chemicals or radiation or just lots of dust even, um, you just want to make sure that you protect your eyes, right? Um, and this is the last fact that I have, and I thought that this one was pretty important. Um, seeing is so important that it takes up more than 50% of your brain functionality. Now, 
that's a lot. <laughs> that's pretty much half of your brain usage. Um, and that could be why vision is considered to be the most important sense that you have. Um, we actually perceive 80% of all our impressions by sight. Um, and if any of our other senses stop working, our eyes is what's going to protect us from danger the best because you're going to see what's going on, right? Um, so on that note, um, just in keeping with the theme of loving your eyes, I would encourage all of you to really prioritize your eyes and their health. Um, I think a lot of people, they don't know how important their vision is um, until they don't have it anymore. And I would not want to see anybody here in that position. Um, so the best way to prioritize your eyes is to have regular eye exams, be kind to your eyes when you're using your devices and just protect your eyes by wearing appropriate eye protection. And that is it for me. So thank you guys for having me here. Um, I'm gonna see if I can stop the share screen. This is so embarrassing. I did not think I would have so much problems with this. <laughs> okay, so let me look at this chat and see if there are any questions. Oh, okay. I think Niall can try to answer a lot of them, actually. Ashley, you asked how effective is blue light? Did you mean how effective is a blue light blocker? Is that what you meant? Yeah. OK, yeah. so a blue light blocker is effective if you get it from somewhere that is, like I said, a reputable provider. So a lot of uh, optical chains will have like a little machine that can test to see how, like that is actually blocking the blue light. The thing with these glasses that you get online is that, I mean, I can't speak for them, but what I would say is that I don't know if they have that equipment to actually test it. So they could be blocking the blue light, they could not be. So again, if you have the blue blocker, think of it as like a nice to have. Like you can get it for extra protection. If you don't get it, you will still be okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Actually, my optometrist, when I went um, and I got it, he was showing me, like, um, okay, like, the tool that they use to, like, check it, he right. was showing me, like, um, okay, so I see, now we're blocking it, and I was just like, okay, because yeah, I was well, really great. Good, and what's going on. Well, that's absolutely great that it, he actually showed you that it works, and I'm glad that you got it, but again, if you didn't get it, you'd still be okay. Okay. Um. Mr. Hanley, Ms. Hanley is asking what causes cataract. Um, so cataract is actually just an age related um, condition. So it's basically where the natural lens inside of your eye starts to get a little bit cloudy. Um, and that's what causes your vision to be blurry. So like I said, it's typically age related. Um, so unfortunately, I mean, well, not unfortunately, but if you live long enough, you'll get it, right? So it's like angry here. Now you can't really do anything about it. Um, now the good news is that cataract is quite a slow thing. So once you, when, if they pick it up in an eye test, it doesn't mean that tomorrow your vision is just gonna go, right? It's gonna be a while before it actually starts to have any effect, right? But it could be caused by other things. So, I mean, exposure to UV can also cause cataract, but that's over an extended period of time. So that's why um, Nan and I were talking about wearing UV protection when you're outdoors. So sunglasses or transitions, um, it can also be caused by trauma. So if you have an eye injury, sometimes it can cause a cataract. Um, some people are born with it as well, um, but that's pretty obvious from when you are a, a baby. Um, also, it could be caused by certain medications as well. So if you're on a very high dose of steroids, that can cause cataract. Um, and if you have conditions like diabetes, it can kind of accelerate the, um, the progress of getting it. So basically, everybody's going to get it at some point. So it's just to kind of monitor and see. Does that answer your question or do you have any other questions about that as well? Thanks. No problem. Um, let me see if there's anything here that I missed in this chat. No, that's pretty much it. Um, so anyone have any other questions or anything for me that they want me to go over again? Oh, I see some dark spots in my vision sometimes and especially when I come inside from bright lights outside. What is that? Okay, that's a great question, Serene. Um, so those dark spots in your vision are called floaters, right? So basically inside of your eye, there's a jelly inside the eye that keeps the eye in its shape, right? And over time, the jelly can break down a little bit. Now that's very normal, 
Okay, but when it breaks down, it doesn't really have anywhere to go because your eye is sealed shut. You don't really want that jelly leaking out of your eye, right? So basically the bits of the jelly will break down and they will float around inside of your eye. And that is why they're called floaters, right? So you probably might not see them all the time. You said you only see them sometimes, right? Um, and then you said you notice them more when you come inside from the bright light outside. It's because when you're outside, the light is it's quite bright, so they're quite apparent. And then when you come inside, your eyes are still kind of getting that, getting used to that after effect of that. So it's very normal. It's nothing to worry about. But if you do notice your floaters increase, so they start to get worse, like you see more of them or you're seeing them more often, um, or you get flashing lights with them, you need to go to an ophthalmologist right away. Does that answer your question? I guess so. Thanks, yes. Okay, great. Thanks. Anyone have any other questions at all? I guess not. Um, Kiyomi, I guess we could pass it back over to you because I think that's it for the questions. But thanks again, guys, for having for inviting me to speak here. I hope this was useful. Hi, thank you so much again. Um, so I would just like to invite our Vice President, Anil, to say a few words. Thank you, Kiyomi. Good afternoon, everyone. So firstly, I would like to thank Dr. Fanon and Ms. Majak for taking the time out of your busy personal and professional schedules to help commemorate Blindness Awareness Month and World Side Day. It was truly a pleasure to have both of you guys with us. To everyone that took the time out of your busy Sunday afternoon, we really appreciate you all for being here and hope you got a better insight on cherishing your eyes. These topics covered should shed a light on how you can preserve your sight and love your eyes by maintaining proper eye health, basic contact lens, health and hygiene, uh, the benefits of going to an optometrist to obtain spectacles as compared to purchasing them online, the importance of regular eye checkups and eye exercises to reduce the eye strains, and lastly, some really interesting facts about vision, which I really liked. Um, so thank you again, everyone, for being here, and I hope to see you all here for our next webinar. Um, again, thank you guys for being here and taking the time to, you know, stay on the webinar and listen on. I appreciate you guys for doing that. Bye, guys. Thank you. Okay, thank you for those words. Um, so I would just like to ask if everyone would be able to spare a couple minutes. We'd just like to share a link in the chat um, where you can give a feedback on the webinar. So I'm gonna send it now. Y'all can feel free to do it. Thank you. I place the link in the chat. You can feel free to give your feedback. And I, I would just like to say thank you again for everyone for coming out this evening, well, this afternoon. And I hope to see you all again. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Have a great bye, afternoon. Guys. Thanks for having us.